Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to World Cup Chatter from here in Lotion, Croatia, where tomorrow the 2018 Mercedes-Benz UCI Downhill World Cup starts. Before the off, though, we're going to take a look at the upcoming season, the men and the women's categories, and uh, some of the topics that may be arising. So we've got some very distinguished guests. Simon Burney from the UCI representing. How are you, Simon? All right, right, Rob. Yes, thank you. We've got the greatest World Cup racer of all time, Greg Minar. Thank you, Rob. That's all right, mate. I don't mind, you can give me the cash afterwards. And Martin Whiteley from the YT Mob, and a man that has been around this sport longer than anyone I know, I think. I guess that's a compliment. Thanks, mate. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, yeah, probably. So we want your questions, please, for this panel. Please send them in to hashtag World Cup Chatter. We've just had qualifying, and it went pretty well. How did you get on, Greg? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a very long track, which makes it really hard to race, because you've got to be precise everywhere. Um, I think for the guys running up the top 10 riders of the field, it was a bit slippery. It's, you know, we've been riding on a track that riders have been going down so the rocks were all clean and now a bit of dust has gone on them and uh, to me it felt really slippery. So, um, yeah, it was a little bit different, but a, a good qualifying all in all. So it's constantly changing. Do you know where you came in when you went across the line? Well, I came in third because I was a third rider down and I slowly <laughs> drifted down into the teens. So it's OK, it's qualifying. Well, most of the fast riders have been down. Now let's have a look at those qualifying times then. And it looks like the Bulldog, Brooke McDonald, is back. New team this year. Or oh, back on his old team of Mondraker on a bike. He won a World Cup on back in uh, 2012. So brilliant to see him there. Dean Lucas, second at the moment, a second back. Your man Aaron Gwynn in third there. How, how did his run go, Martin? Uh, he said on the jump coming into the urban area, he made a small mistake, which might have affected his, to um, his top speed. But overall, he was pretty happy. And uh, I mean, look at the times. I mean, it's very, very close. In the women, we saw seven within five seconds. So it's going to be close racing tomorrow. I think it definitely is. So we have also got seven stops to you for you this year that we're going to bring from around the globe, live on Red Bull TV. Uh, we're starting here in Lotion. Then we go to Fort William. After that, it's Leergang, Val de Sole, Andorra, St. Anne and La Bresse. I mean, so si, how hard was it? To, we've got a new starting spot here. I mean, how difficult is that to organise? Why don't we see more new spots? Yeah, it's quite difficult getting that balance between the kind of the classic venues that we want to keep going back to and bringing in the new ones. It's quite difficult. Obviously, we get a few uh, a few bids every year for new venues, and it's just trying to figure out what we can, how it all fits with the travel, with the rider schedules, with budgets, with uh, there's so much to take into consideration. So it's yeah, it's a. Uh, so far, so good for this one, you know. You know, it's turned out nice. We've got a, a lovely venue. We've got a new course, which is proven interesting. I think it's going to be short and fast, like Greg was saying. So it's just mixing everything together with a new bid, new organisation to understand if we can kind of make it a classic. Well, I think it's halfway there. In fact, there's a very strong argument going around that we don't really leave. We just have the entire series here this summer. Why would, why would bother going anywhere else? It's perfect. Works for me. The sun's shining. It's really good. Greg, you're starting your 22nd World Cup season, which is astonishing in itself. I mean, you're still as motivated as, as you were at the end of last year? Yeah, I am. It's, uh, I get such a good off-season going back to South Africa. We, we, our country's main, typically focused on marathon and you know, endurance side of mountain biking. So I feel like I have a great separation from the sport, and then I get all excited coming in and you know, maybe a little bit rusty towards the beginning of the season. But as the season goes on... Uh, get within it but I do enjoy it I love it it's you know we don't race enough and uh, I think that's what kept me in for 22 years well there is that argument as well are we going to see a, a larger World Cup good to put you on the spot eh, Sai yeah, <laughs> we all want more races don't we Martin absolutely we all want, and it's honestly it's just down to budget that's all it comes down to you know I'd, I'd love to see one or two more rounds up to 10 would be the ideal scenario uh, and it's just about money. That's all it is. That's all it is. Yeah. Well, it's a, a work in progress. Let's have a look back at your season last year. Didn't win the World Cup overall in the end, but it was one hell of a season. Two big wins for you. The first of those came in Fort William. You're third on the trot there. I mean, you, you own that place, right? Well, yeah, it was a good season. Uh, Fort William's been a pretty special place to race at. And, uh, yeah, probably not the greatest inter season that I would have liked, but... Um, it was, it was a nice season. It, it's always great being able to battle it out with some guys. And it was always down to that last race, which was pretty cool and exciting for the fans. As I said, it didn't go my way, but nevertheless, it was still a good season racing. And Lenzer Heider we saw there as well. I mean, 
World Championships are there at the end of the year. Won there last year. Feeling pretty good, looking towards that. Do you, do you build your season as you go? I mean, you just said you're a bit of a slow starter, which I think I disagree with massively. <laughs> There's nothing slow about a big GM. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't typically build up to World Champs. To me, it's like you got to be ready for the first race of the season. You want to win World Cups. You want to win the overall. So, you know, you just take each weekend as it comes. But um, if we're trying to be ready for this race, and then we'll take it through to... I mean, uh, Linz Ahada was a bit lucky there last year, but, um, you know, world champs, some people get lucky, some people don't. So That's what that race is about. Sure. Aaron's never won the world championship. You're his team manager. I mean, that would be a big thing on his calendar this year. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, the number one goal. Um, he's also chasing this guy here for World Cup wins of all time. They're the only two things he's got in his focus this year. He'd love to win more races, but the number one would be Linz Ahada. Greg's thrilled to hear that, that he's going to... <laughs> and he'll be the first man to ever win six World Cup overall titles as well, so it's a massive year for him. Yeah, he's equal with Nicola Vuglio at five overalls right now. Six would be a record, yeah. And what did you... What, you know, last year, we going back to Val de Sole, that final, I mean, it literally came down to his race run. And the most astonishing thing for me was finding out that he didn't know that Greg had had any problems. That was what blew my mind. You know what I mean? He didn't, because he had the opportunity to, but he said, no, we're here to race. Well, look, so he could have blown it all out the window going faster than he needed to. Both he and Greg are very similar. You, you get in the start house to do the best race you can. You don't listen to those other factors, you, especially the last race of the season. You may want to do a percentage season if you've got stronger tracks and weaker tracks, but when it comes to the last race, you're going in for the win. He certainly did. It was, it was, uh, it was spectacular final. Well done. <laughs> Even though it didn't go your way, we all we all enjoyed it. Was it was a great you. race, though. It definitely was a great race, and Aaron rode incredibly well on that track with all the pressure going in. So, yeah, it was a good race. Did you enjoy it, Sai? Because you do come more from the cross-country background, I suppose. But you're starting to love the downhill now. I've seen you getting more and more involved. Yeah, it's been a few years now. That I've been hanging around at the downhill I know, races yeah, as well. You know, true. Yeah. I'll give you that. In the percentage-wise, it's maybe not as big, but you know, <laughs> I've not done as many as Greg, obviously. No, that's true enough. But you like it, right? I love it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's bike racing. You know, it's 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 close and it's exciting. And I'm, yeah, it's, it's, I'm a fan. Yeah. Good, good, good. Well, Rick, our main man in the pits, went and spoke to the winner earlier the week. Aaron, before we talk about this year, let's talk about last year and what an incredible way to finish off the season. How dramatic was it from where you were sitting? Uh, it was good, man. Really fun. It was. I just wanted to get into Valdezol last year with like a fighting chance at the championship. And uh, after Saint Anne, we came in I think 30 seconds back on Greg, and uh, so it was set up to be a perfect battle. And unfortunately, he had some issues there, but we were able to pull it off. And from all the ups and downs all year that we had gone through, it it definitely felt pretty good. So it was a uh, it was a really fun season for me. You know, all the way through, even through the ups and downs, it was fun for me, and it was it was amazing to be able to pull it off at the end. So yeah, it was a great year. And have you had a good off season? What sort of form do you arrive here in Croatia with? Uh, I feel good. Feel really good. I had a, an awesome off season. Just uh, a lot of fun at home, hanging out, and building a house, and doing a few different things too. So just a really fun off season for me and productive. Uh, when it comes to training, I had a knee surgery last year coming into the to the season. So this year I've been healthy all the way through, and and I feel stronger than I've ever been. So. Um, it's been good, man. Everything's been going real smooth. And just finally then, a brand new track here in Lucian, which we don't get that often. How are you finding it? It's good, man. I, I love riding something new. Just the like the excitement of coming somewhere new and, and just the experience of, uh, yeah, just everything, something new to kind of get used to. So um, that's been fun. It's a beautiful place here. And then the track itself is is cool. I like it. It's, it's different and it's a, a new track to learn. And it's rocky and lots of little lines here and there, and it's definitely got its tricky spots, So, and it's short, so it's going to make for great racing usually. So um, I'm looking forward to it. So hopefully we just keep air in the tires and, and everything will be smooth sailing, hopefully. <laughs> All right, thanks very much. Good luck this weekend. Thank you, guys. As cool as a queue coming up, man. Well, Miriam Nicole has managed to join us now. Miriam, the World Cup winner from last year. How are you? Bonjour. Hello. You all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. And your qualifier was a little bit up in the air. That you weren't happy with the time you were given. Is that is that where you've been sorting out? <laughs> no, no, I was happy. <laughs> Just started a little bit too early, but everything is fine now, and uh, I've got a good time. Good. Let's have a look at those results then. There you are in third place. Not too bad. It's all yeah. right. 1.8 back. Yeah. Could just start like this. <laughs> yeah, it could be worse. What do you think about Rachel Ather? That's some comeback, isn't it? Yeah, it's good. Tracy Hannah there in second place. 
Tani Seagrave, what happened to hers? I don't know, I haven't seen her yet, so it's really tricky on this track, so just a, a little mistake and you're a bit back, but uh, it's really tight, as you can see, so everything can happen tomorrow. What do you think about the course? Are you a fan of it? It's a new, I mean, let's be honest, everyone, I think we we came here expecting the worst. It was, you know, the, the naysayers were criticising this course for the last six months as potentially being the worst one the World Cup has ever opened with. It's turning out, I think, to be one of the best. Yeah, for sure it's different, but uh, yeah, you have to, to manage to, to go through the rocks and it's hard because you cannot go as fast as you want to because it's a bit dangerous, but it's short but really intense, so it's different and uh, I think people are happy with it. I bet you're happy to see a fresh, fresh but I think it was Maribel 2014 was the last new venue we had, so. Yeah, I mean, this reminds me a lot of Cap Die with the rocks, but with jumps in it, like Cap Die with <laughs> yeah. jumps, you know. Modernised. Yeah, a little bit modernised. The, the average speed is lower, you've got to think a lot more as Miriam said, it's quite difficult, but in the, in the end, the steepness of this track is impressive. It really has a lot of tricky stuff the riders have to think through. I don't think it's anything like the guys were saying before we got here. No, no, the, I think the, a lot of the helmet cams are a bit misleading. I mean, you've got a bit of a smooth section at the top, but then it's basically like all the technical parts of, say, Val de Sole rammed together in about a minute and a half, two minutes through that wood, isn't it? It's how intense and physical well, when is you it? say Val de Sole, Val de Sole, you got gradient to get you back up to pace. Yeah, you don't. So one mistake, it's you can't pedal because there's rock, so you have to really carry speed everywhere. And like you said, as soon as you hit that last jump, it's all gravel into the first corner, which is pretty tricky. So, I mean, the naysayers always come off one of the forums. So, I mean, all those guys are desk jockeys anyway. <laughs> They've never been to a race in their life, so... As it is, you can't ever believe what they say. No, no, we've learned a lesson. Greg, we've got a question in on social media from Benny White. I thought I was reading Barry White. I didn't know he was a fan of mountain biking. (laughs) (laughs) Benny White on Facebook. What do you do, if anything, to manage flat tyres during a race run like this? Can you? I mean, we try so many different things, but back to basics, just go up in pressure. So we, we ran a little bit harder than, than usual, yeah. Anything you do on the YT mob? Yeah, look, you're never going to solve a cut tyre wall, but the flat tyre defender we run is something we really believe in. But a lot of teams you diff- do use different things, and uh, but honestly, a cut tyre wall here is not going to... I mean, that'll happen to anybody, no matter what they're running. I think it can. Well, let's have a... Uh, we, we spent Anna actually to speak to my co-commentator, Claudio Calori, to look at his favourites coming into this season. OK, Claudio, on to the men. Is there a favourite, maybe two favourites for this year? Again, it's two for me. There's the two men you can never count out as long as they keep on riding bikes, and that's Aaron Gwynn and Greg Minar. OK, and there's a lot of young riders now coming up through the ranks. Would, can one of them perhaps surprise us? It's really hard to pick one of them. You know, there's Finn Isles, there's Laurie Greenland, and there's Pierron who surprised us after injury last year with the second place. So we, we don't know what they're up to this year, but um, probably the most consistent for now would be Laurie Greenland, and he must be hungry to take that top step. OK, so two favourites again, but some really exciting racing in prospect. OK, welcome back to World Cup chat here in Lotion, Croatia. We're going to talk next about some big changes in the rules coming into 2018. I'm so, so, so glad you're here, Martin, because the, the, the big and one Simon. is... Uh, oh, Simon. Simon will help too. Yeah, good. Yeah, you ready for this? Bring it on. Between you, you can manage this. The protected rider rules changed, and go on, hit well, me the, with it. In the men's case, there's always been 20 protected riders, and there's no change to the number of protected riders this year. It's just who they are. And one thing we've done is taken the top 10 from last year's overall, and they're protected all season, and they'll be joined by a different 10 every week based on the World Cup overall of that season. So it means you're getting the current best guys, and you've got the the legends from last year, if you like. So it gives the fans someone to follow all year. It means that there are names they get to know. It doesn't chop and change. uh, But there's always 20. Same with the women. It's 10 for the women, but five from last year are maintained all year. And when you say protected, of course, that means they're protected, but still qualifying st- sorts the order out, right? So Right, right. qualifying still determines the order, but they're protected, exactly. Except for the ten legends, as far as I know, they, they get on TV 
each year, each week. And that means, you know, hopefully we won't have this kind of fracas we had after well, Lord last year, you it, know? It makes no sense for, especially a lot of the bigger teams, that you can have a top rider, there's a thunderstorm in Lords, and suddenly a whole season's work is wiped out in three minutes, and they have to fight to get protected again when they've earned it for a whole season. So there has to be some recognition for these guys that are consistent on every track to give them that protection. I, I, I'm totally with you as well. I think it's great that we have the regulars. I mean, look at the look at the state of Lord last year. Yeah, I mean, th th this is beyond anyone's control, and these are the greatest yeah. riders in the world slipping off a, a dirt track. It doesn't make sense that they don't have protection the next week for something so extraordinary. Yeah, it was. That was a pretty hard day at the office, wasn't it, Greg? There, right? Eh? That's Not... quite tough, but I had a fair result there, so it wasn't too bad for me. How was that one for you, Sai? Yeah, interesting. Yeah, obviously, it just. That's the kind of event that throws up these questions about what we can, how we can refine the sport, how we can make it better, how we can keep the people like Greg and Miriam there week in, week out. You know, they're, they're the, the people that the sport is, is based around now. These legends, these kind of, you know, the top riders, they're the stars. And we need to make sure that where we can, they still need to perform, but we, we need to make sure that they're always part of the show, you know? Well, that's right, because that's we who still, we want to see. Exactly, but still give opportunities for the, for the new yeah. young hotshots to break through and to, uh, you know, to join them. You have someone saying Valentine you know, Rossi crashes in practice or whatever, he'll still be in the race yeah. at the back of the grid or whatever, but he's in the race. And if you bring in a new title sponsor for your team, you can't explain to your guys, sorry, our number one, two, three guy is not racing on the finals day. He won't be there. No, that's that doesn't right. make sense to them. Are you a fan of it, Miriam? Yeah, I think after Lords and a few races, we could see that a, a rule needed to be. So, yeah, I think that's a good thing. What's the process to get a rule change through, right? Because I'd imagine, knowing what a team manager's meeting like, there's a few captains. Yeah, no, but we have a really good exchange with the UCI. They hold meetings with the elite teams every, every well, at least twice a year. And we're able to raise all those concerns directly with the UCI. And as far as a governing body relationship with their stakeholders, I think it's one of the best there is. So I'm not saying they can Simon sitting here, but that's something he he did introduce, and the athletes also have their own rep in, in, in Greg here. Yeah, and, and uh, Miriam, right? Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so all of these people have an exchange with the UCI. It's all on you, Greg. It's amazing. I get to walk down the course with David and Miriam and adjust the course to how we think suits us. So it's, it's brilliant. <laughs> That's the rumor. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you qualify? No, no, uh, yeah. no French rules. Work out so today. It's not true, all those rumors. <laughs> and Sai, si, you know, Mercedes Benz is the title sponsor. That's massive, right? It's big, yeah. It's, and it's a really, it's a great name for us to bring into the sport. I think it gives so much credibility to, to the sport and to the, 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 the type of sponsors that hopefully the teams can now attract off the back of having a big name uh, involved as the title sponsor of the World Cup Series. OK, thank you. We're going to look at some uh, social media questions here. We've got one from Harv in the UK for you, Greg. On a scale of 1 to 10, how disappointed were you when you snapped that Santa Cruz in half, which we must say was by hitting a post? It didn't... I wasn't disappointed at all. I was um, quite relieved it wasn't my leg. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got more, right? It's not yeah, like yeah, yeah. it's not like they're knocking it's, them out uh, your, your wages. No, 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 no. Well, I think it did. Russ got skin tight these days. I think <laughs> he did dock it. But that was, I don't know, that to me was like the ultimate you, really, to be back up, what was it, an hour later, going for a World Cup title? Yeah, I think about an hour. And it was, if it wasn't for one of the guys on track that managed to take my bike down, it was quite high up, and there's no, no way down from there. And to, to carry two pieces of bike down, I wasn't going to make it in time. So I walked ahead and... And uh, well, my bike ran it down, and Marshy swapped out that front end and back up to the top. And, and this track here is a real bike breaker, isn't it? It doesn't get much worse than this. I wouldn't say so much a bike, but um, wheels, tyres will take a beating, yeah. It's, um, it's just rock. There's, there's not much soil. Um, and I, I think the guys did a really good job last night of trying to take out some of the edges of, of really sharp rocks. I think today there were a lot less punches. Um, but still, it's a brutal track. It's uh, it's just rock. Yeah. It is. Well, how are you getting on up there, Miriam? You had a lot of flat tyres, or? Yeah, yeah. I think my last flat tyres was ten years ago, and uh, two yesterday. So I was really <laughs> surprised. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, like Greg said, I just put much more hair in, and even with the system we have, you know, that's the best things you have to do. I've got a question here for you from JH, whoever that is. Mm -hmm. How do you stay focused from the top to the bottom in a race run and remember lines when you're going at race pace? <laughs> we, we do a lot of practice, so we know the track really well, and just when you're having fun, you're living the dream and just uh, carrying speed, and when you go do a bit of mistake, that's when you try to, to stop focusing on the track, so that's it. <laughs> How many practice runs for you is 
is typical in a, in a race weekend coming into tomorrow? Uh, I think I do 10 to 12 before final, so that's not too much, but uh, that's enough, and we have to keep some energy to, to be at our best on the final, so... Yeah, that's good. 10 or 12, I don't think I'd have the energy left to race. What about you, Greg? It's yeah, it's just one, isn't it? You just have one quick ride down. He's moved the tapes during the course walk using his position as a uh, rider <laughs> representative. Got it. Got it. <laughs> no, it's about the same. I think we do about 10 runs. Um, <clears throat> we try and do as little as possible, really, um, and just really focus on learning the track and lines and, and trying to get a flow. Uh, you want to arrive in that final as strong as possible. So. Yeah, cool. And the, it's gone, right? What were you going to no, say? No, just in your career, you thought minimum two runs was maximum two runs. <laughs> yeah. So you got the two stickers and you were done. Back in my day, the <laughs> bikes wouldn't get to the bottom anyway, so there was no point practising. Miriam, we're going to La Bresse at the end of the year. There's a new track. Have you seen it or you know anything about it? No, no, but we've been racing and Greg has been racing there as well. It's not like the old World Cup. It's uh, where a, a French Cup used to be, so it's, it's good and gnarly. I remember a steep wall. That was really scary, so... That's going to be fun. That's what you, so you've actually been on that track as well? I, I have, and I remember it being really good. It had a great combination of, of different aspects to it. There's some good technical, some typical French high speed. It's a really typically good French track. Um, it was about 2004 that I was there. So yeah, it, was, it was the Honda days. Yeah, I was about 30 Honda. back then and racing. It was pretty good. <laughs> So have you been there another look, site visit? Yeah, we did the first site visit when they were trying to figure out where to go and if they could fit a double in, because at La Bresse, historically, they've done single cross countries and downhills, but they've never been able to do it both at the same time because of the way they have to close the town down. So they took the ski area, whatever, 10, 15 kilometres away, and uh, we've managed to figure out a way to combine the two. So, yeah, they've got good experience of organising the World Cup, and it's just finding that venue where we can do both, both disciplines. And we know from the past, the French love mountain biking, and in La Bresse, they they really go nuts for it. They right? do. They love it. Yeah, Even yeah. 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 Absalom apparently is racing the downhill there. That, that's what I've heard. Well, he's a local boy, and that's why yeah. the crowds come. That's from. a good rumor. I'll spread <laughs> that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's news to him as well. <laughs> Let's have a look at the uh, women's competition then from last year. You're the World Cup winner. Two wins for you. I mean, it must have felt pretty good after all the injuries you've had as well, Miriam, over the past. I don't know what five. How many? What was it like? 10 broken collarbones in about three years? <laughs> no, no, but yeah, I think the last three woke up, I did not finish the season, so the goal last year was just to finish, and I managed to win the overall, so that was kind of cool. That's a big one ticked off, right? Yeah. <laughs> just need to be world champ now, and that's, that's the easy one. <laughs> But it was, a, it was a great year. I mean, we saw four different win, w women win in 2017. Tani, Tracy, Rachel and yourself. It's, is it fair to say that the, the level of talent now in the women's is really a lot stronger than it was? And it, it's coming back, the women's category. Yeah, I think so. It's really hard now and we have to push harder and harder. And as you can see, like this race today on Quali, I think there is like five seconds between the five first women. So that's really tight. And, uh, and I think that's good racing. And it's like the men it's exciting to watch so i like it like this okay well rachel atherton is back she's the fastest qualifier here and rick went and spoke to her earlier in the week rachel you missed a lot of last season obviously with that injury how tough was it for you to be have to sit back and look at the race and almost a spectator for parts of it yeah it was uh, it was pretty bizarre situation to be in you know one minute you're fired up ready to ready to take the win and literally the next minute you you're out of the race and you you're focused on you know when you can race again not not if you're going to win and it was kind of it was quite cool once I'd accepted that to you know to see the other girls how they tackle it kind of see how they you know do a race because normally you're so focused on on your own race that you you don't get to see them riding really so it was it was kind of cool once you got over the heartbreak of it <laughs> and how's your off season been what sort of form have you arrived here at round one up yeah i mean um it was a a bit of a complicated break i broke my collarbone at world champs and it actually took a lot longer than we expected the ligaments were broken and the bone itself just took ages to heal so it was really january when i started training properly and riding but but since then you know it's been it's been going really well and just just really enjoying being back on the bike and and kind of building that confidence slowly you know it takes it takes a while to get get your confidence but now i'm feeling good and, and really excited to race so and we've got a new track this weekend it's been a long time since we had one of those how difficult is that to learn for a racer? Yes, yeah, it's, it's really exciting to come to a new track, you know, new venue, you don't know what, quite what to expect. And, and walking the track for the first time, you, you're like, oh, you know, wow, look at it, look at it. And you've got no kind of 
old memories, you know, you, you don't think, oh, last year I fell here or last year this happened. So it's, it's nice to have a, a clean slate and, you know, what a beautiful place to, to come to for the first round. Rachel, thanks very much. Good luck this weekend. Thank you. Cheers. Well, good to hear Claudio there. Seems to be recovering from his uh, concussion. Oh, Rachel, excuse me. We're going to hear from Claudio in a moment. We've got one here from Alex on Facebook. What are your tasks as rider reps? What do you have to do for that? To ride fast? No, for, <laughs> to be the rider representative. Ah, right. Um, so we have to check the course before the, um, before the race and then see if there is some, some safety problem or, or some lines or we, if we should open a place or not. And uh, then listen to the riders and report to, the, to Simon or, or someone else or David on the track. And, uh, and then, yeah, ask everyone what people think about everything and just uh, report that to Simon. And then from you, I guess you go and get these changes done. Is that how it goes? Yeah, yeah. I, it's just these two are the voice of the riders. You know, we've got we've got voices in in every other group. You know, all of our other uh, <coughs> colleagues, and we just need the riders. They're the most important one. So we need, but we can't have 150 riders all giving us their opinion. So these two kind of filter it down to the to the important stuff. That'd be even more of a nightmare. Can it you would, imagine? I mean, 15 team managers is bad enough. 150 yeah. riders would be awful. Because so. there is definitely one thing we know is there's no pleas in everyone. Exactly. You know, and then like Miriam and Greg, they come to the commission meetings. They've also got athlete commission as well, uh, which is all the cycling disciplines. So they represent mountain bike on that on that commission. Uh, so yeah, they're, they're the voice and that's who we, that we listen to. And on the day, obviously, like Miriam said, if, if there's something happening on the track, uh, we can kind of, you know, react faster, but it's, it's more about longer term as well. You know, it's, it's getting what the riders want, how they want to see the sport in the, in the, in the near future. How did you actually become a rider representative, Greg? What's the process? Um, you get voted in by the riders. So it gets narrowed down to a handful of guys and then uh, the riders vote you in. Okay, I've got a question for you, uh, Miriam, on social from DJ Soul Glow. What, is, what does it take for you to go from good to great? What is it that makes a good rider a great one? Oh, I don't know. I think you just have to, to do everything as best as you can, to work hard and then during your race to, to enjoy every moment and to go as fast as you can. <laughs> Greg? You, well, you're, you're pretty great. <laughs> Come on. How'd you do it? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I would just say it's... Uh, the difference between a good rider and a great rider, a great rider can probably ride just over 100% within control, if that makes sense. A good rider can ride at 100%. So it's just being able to push that push that bar a little bit more in the final and uh, squeeze out some more time. Huh. Yeah, good answer. What do you think, Martin? Well, yeah, there's a lot of very good riders that when they put a number plate on their bike go backwards. There's, there's, there's good riders and there's riders who race great. And I think that's a bit different, you know? There are a lot of good riders, but the, the guys that can put it together on any kind of track and race really well, whether it's wet, whether it's rocky, whether it's steep, whatever, that's, they're great racers. That's a bit, diff bit different to being a great rider. Because it's racecraft. You have to know how to manage a season. You have to know how to manage a track and finesse these rocks, not attack these rocks. And they're great racers. And I think that's a big difference, difference to a great rider. What, um, Miriam, what do you think, how, how much of the game is mental, do you think, when you're up in the start hut? How, is, how hard is it to put that race run together? Because there's lots of great riders, like, you, you know, but to be a good racer is something separate. Well, you have to do, again, some good practice to go, yeah, really fast and uh, to manage to, to do every section really clear and without doing too many mistakes and uh, pushing harder than someone else, sometimes on the pedaling or, yeah, it's a lot in the, in the head and... Uh, yeah, I think, like Greg said, it's uh, pushing harder than everyone else. How do, you, uh, how do you stay calm before a race run? You know, we've been doing a lot of testing, a lot of training, so before the race, you know, everything is done, so you, it's no point for stressing. You, you cannot do anything, you've done everything before, so you just have to stay calm and wait for the run. And you, Greg, I mean, you've, you've done, I think you've had more World Cup starts than anyone else here, I'd imagine. Yeah, probably. I'm taking over from Steve, I think. <laughs> it's, uh, I still get nervous. And I think that's like, for me, some of the excitement about racing is that when you're focused and you're nervous and, and you're anxious to race, it, putting it all together, it, it's, it's rewarding at the bottom. You know, if you, yeah, you might not be first, you might be third, but if you put together a great race and with all the pressure, all the nerves on a really gnarly track, it's rewarding. So 
Uh, I think that's, you know, it's, it's, it's a sensation of feeling that you don't really get much in life unless you're racing on the edge like that. No, that, yeah, that's right. That's, that's kind of what keeps everyone coming back. And I, I don't think he'd mind me saying, but he would often struggle at smaller local races because there was nothing to hype him up. There's no crowd. It didn't feel like a big event. When he'd come here, those guys who did well on the small races would fall apart under the pressure. So it's almost the opposite way. The really big guys sometimes struggle at the small events because there's nothing to amp them up and get them focused on what they've got to do and they come here it's a whole different thing okay cool well we sent claudio to have a chat with anna about his favorites coming into 2018. okay claudio let's cut to the chase who is your favorite to win the women's overall title this year well it's a tough one for me to decide between miriam nicole and rachel atherton both of them well especially rachel at the moment coming back from from injury had a really bad season last year and uh, she came back from injury many times and I know that good good sports personalities they always want to show that they can still do it so Rachel must be on fire and Miriam did the same last year came back from injury won World Cups and uh, so I would say it's one of the two. Okay so Rachel and Miriam are the favorites but is there perhaps another another woman who might surprise us this year? Well, obviously there's Tane. Uh, she wouldn't be a surprise if she takes it. So uh, let's say it's one of the three. <laughs> okay, so not so much a favourite, but three big names to look out for this year. Well, you made it into Claudio's favourites, Miriam. Thank you, Claudio. Look at that, I really appreciate eh? it. You've hit the big time. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you see as being your strongest competition then? The usual suspects, I'd imagine. I don't know, you know, like today we are all really fast, so yeah, I, I bet Rachel's going to be fast and also she took some confidence today, so yeah, I would say Rachel, but Tani is really fast, Tracy, and there is also Marine Cabero who got fifth yeah. today, so yeah, yeah. fourth, so yeah, let's look at her. You better watch out for her, she's yeah. French. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Rob, we heard Claudia's, what about your favourites for the men's? For the men's tomorrow? Yeah. Uh, Brooke McDonald. It's a good bet. He's had a fast time training and it was quick today. No, I'm going from his quality. I mean, it was incredible. But I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, you, Aaron, of course. Aaron Marine Pierron's been riding well as well, yeah. I've spotted out. So, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be yeah, interesting. Dean Lucas up there as well. You, both Dean and Brooke were really quick yesterday, time practice. So. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a heck of a race tomorrow, I think. Full of, full of drama. How much will experience count tomorrow on that track? Is it too short to use your head? Is it just all out or...? Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to think it will help. I'm hoping it does. But uh, I don't know. It's, it, it is short. It's fast. It's, it's a high tempo. It's, it's, you, you're right down the bottom before you can even think about things. It's, um, it is intense, but I think you can easily overcook it. So si, who's your money on for tomorrow? We'll start with the women. Putting you on the spot. That and Caroline Chausson, she's good, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's What's pretty good. <laughs> we haven't speak about Cecile Ravenel. She got fifth today and That's she unreal. won like the two last stage of the Enduro World Series. So, yeah, she did she, really good today. And this is, I believe, her second ever downhill race on a downhill bike, right? Yeah, I mean, there was Val de Sole under last year. Has she spent more time on the downhill bike in the winter? Uh, yeah, I think she spent a lot more she, time. Is she coming for you? Yeah, Because so, <laughs> your teammates as well. This <laughs> yeah. might get a bit awkward. I will try to have Max liking me more. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. Yeah. So it's going to be a good battle, but we are really good friends and she can ride fast. And so, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Martin, what do you think about Rachel's comeback? That was impressive. <clears throat> yeah, really. But I, I think this year is probably one of the most exciting women's seasons we've seen in about five years. Not only, I mean, it was unfortunate for Rachel to get injured, but it opened the eyes of a lot of the other girls of what they can do against each other. And I think that allowed them the freedom, psychological freedom, to get on the top step. And, and now they come into this season thinking, well, I've been there and I liked it and I want to be back there. So I think you'll see one of five women, you know, could, could win any week, any one of five. Yeah, I believe. I don't, I don't think the women's field has been this strong in a long, long time. Like you say, there is one of... Any, yeah, it's good. Question for you, Si, come in. What sort of rider does this track suit? I don't know if that's really the that's question for you, to me, be honest. No. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that one. Yeah. Well, let's ask Can Greg. I knock that one over to Greg? Yeah. 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 Well, um, I would have thought someone smooth and, and could hold a good line and pacey, but when you see Brooke and Dean Lucas just ripping it up, it just shows that it's open up to anyone, really. It's uh, guys are riding aggressive and can hold the line or are going to be up there. And I think Brooke showed it. I mean, 
was he wasn't just ahead. He had put a decent gap into the guys. So, I mean, it's a, it's a tough track. It's it's flat turns. It's rocky. It's brutal. Um, it's it's a high pace. I, I don't really know if it really suits one particular rider. I've had another question on, on social. When did you start racing, Miriam? When I was five. And you came up through the, the French system where you did trials, cross country and, uh, is that yeah, right? Yeah, that's it. Like French mountain bike yeah, school. Yeah. Or you go from BMX or you come from this kind of race where with the same bike you have to race every different kind of uh, thing. So yeah, I came from here. Yeah, yeah. And you, Greg, when, how old were you? Because you started with a bit of motocross, didn't you? Yeah, well, BMX for a year and I thought it was hella boring. So went to motocross for quite some time and then came over to mountain bikes when I was 15, 16. Never looked back. No, no. It's not had a bad career. I've got a question for me, whether I prefer 27 and a half or 29. I'll go with a 29, like the big dog here. You tried the 29 wheels, they weren't for you, right? Yeah, I did two walk-up last season, and uh, I prefer 27 because I think I'm smaller and I'm not as powerful, but uh, both sometimes I wish I could have my 29ers, and I don't think there is one who is faster than the other one. You know, it depends on every section section on the track. So. Yeah, and I think a lot of it comes down to the rider. I mean, Aaron, was he beat... He beat this man last year on his 29s, on the 27 and a half, but it didn't seem like there was much in it, really. Is it, is it a rider preference thing, or what, what, what's I, the deal? I, I, I was asked this in Lords, and I said that I really think it was the first time I've seen Greg on a bike that was his right size. Yeah. And when I think back to the Honda days and look at those photos, I can't believe he got the results on such a tiny, tiny bike. So I really do believe that Jack Moyer and, and Florent Payet and these guys really benefit from 29ers. Danny Hart, Laurie Greenland will not benefit from 29ers. And then there are guys in the middle. Dean Lucas, I think, is right on the cusp of it. And then you get a little bit below that. That, I think they'd struggle a little bit on courses. So I personally don't want a truck full of every single wheel option, frame option that you need to run every bike on every course. So you need to make some sort of decision. But uh, it certainly works for Greg, and, and that makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah, you're very happy on that yeah, on I love the big it. bike. It's, yeah, like Martin said, I mean, I look back to video of, of, on the Honda days, and it looks like I'm riding a BMX. You should see the and ATX one I used to ride, man. <laughs> yeah. What the heck? What were those I things with the 20? You, you're tall. You know it's like it's. You sent it in the bike now. It yeah. just feels like an animal bike. That's it. You go on 29 when you're at height, and it, yeah, that's yeah, it. Sure. It just feels great. So, sure. right, last question then. Who's the favourite in the men? Simon. Carefully. You remember oh, you oh, sat oh, next oh, yeah. to him. Yeah. Come on, Simon. Yeah. It's hard, for me, it's hard to look past Aaron, Aaron and Greg. You know, it's, it's hard for me to, to see past those two. And yeah. I think, you know, I think if that battle continues this year, I'll be, I'll be delighted. You know. Well, yeah, the biggest threat to Aaron and Greg here, after we've seen what we've seen in time practice and qualifying, is a guy like Brooke, who you would normally think attacks the track really hard. It's going to bite back. It's really rocky, but it paid off for him. You know, he made a mistake in that run too, so he blew out a corner. So he's really going for it, and uh, so I think he's a danger man. Oh, yeah. He's proven that yeah. in time training and in qualifying. Yeah. Dave, Miriam, who's your money on? Uh, I will put my money on my new teammate, Amori Pion. <laughs> he's incredible. He rode really well, uh, too. Nice. Well, yeah. yeah. Very good. Well, one thing we do know is tomorrow is going to be an incredible race. It's live here on Red Bull TV at 12.30 Central European time for the women, and the men start at 2 p.m. Listen, we're going to wrap things up. I know you want to go and get... I don't know what you're going to do. What are you going to do now? Go and relax, I imagine. Go for a swim. GM, you getting in the put in the sea? Well, not after that qualifying. We've got some work to do. <laughs> OK. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Thanks for joining us at home. We will see you tomorrow. Till then, goodbye.